Hello and welcome to today's webinar. This is Mark Plantier of Intercon Industries, and we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation on how to optimize inkjet printing adhesion for wire and cable marking. And whether you are here today to learn more about implementing the technology or to simply ensure your process are optimized, you've certainly come to the right place. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and you will be able to access both the recording and presentation slides once they are available online, usually within 24 hours. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the GoToWebinar question tool. You may submit a question at any time. We will reserve time at the end of the presentation to answer as many questions as we can. Additionally, all attendees to today's webinar will receive a personalized certificate recognizing their participation. Today's presentation will cover the following topics, the benefits of continuous inkjet printing, how plasma and flame treatment enable adhesion, keys to substrate and ink interfacial adhesion, why ink formulation matters, benefits of UV LED ink curing technology, and again, at the end, we'll leave time for your questions. We're fortunate today to have presenters from three companies who are experts in the technologies and applications involving inkjet printing on wire and cable. Wilson Lee is Entercon's business development director. Entercon is a family-owned business with an international footprint. The company has expertise with all types of surface treating technologies. Wilson has extensive experience in surface treating applications over a wide variety of industries. He has a passion for solving customer application challenges by employing flame and plasma technologies. Wilson earned an electrical engineering degree and an MBA from Clemson University. Huck Hyde is a technical engineer and has been with Jem Gravier for over 17 years. Jem is a family-owned business that began in 1952 and today has four locations and nearly 100 employees. With over 35 years of experience with all types of printing, Huck is part of Jem's Research and Development Center in Nixon, Missouri. His contributions include the development of specialty inks and applications for marking wire and cable. Pamela Lee is Senior Product Manager of Omnicure UV LED Curing Solutions at Excelitas Technologies. Omnicure is part of the lighting division of Excelitas, which is a $1 billion company with over 6,000 employees headquartered in Waltham, Mass. Pamela holds an MBA and Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of Toronto. Pam has authored several published articles and has presented at a number of industry-related speaking engagements. The technology synergies and partnerships of these companies have produced countless successful implementations of inkjet printing on wire and cable. And with guidance from today's presenters, you'll be able to optimize technology for your operations. With that, I will turn it over to Wilson Lee, who will cover the importance of preparing a surface for adhesion. Thanks, Mark. Surface challenges. All right, when we look at this application, uh, one of the things that we see is that we have challenges with the surface itself. The implementation is not generally that difficult. The wire is moving by. We point the plasma or the flame at the target and or the area that's going to be printed on, and that is the easy part. The hard part generally is the surface itself. So what are those challenges? Uh, most of the jackets that go on wire and cable are low energy materials. Uh, and what do we mean by that? When we mean that, what we mean is if you measure it with dyne or contact angle, it's either a low dyne or a high contact angle. Uh, and that just means that you have a low surface energy. And in general, low surface energies lead to uh, poor adhesion. Higher surface energies lead to higher adhesion. So what causes some of these low energy situations? Well, first, there could be surface contamination uh, that need to be cleaned off, whether they're organic or inorganic. Uh, many times there's additives uh, into the resin. Uh, maybe it's a flame retardant. Maybe it's a material or something that goes in there that will allow uh, higher and lower temperatures for the wire, depending on what kind of service that wire is going to be in. Uh, but all plastic materials generally have limited bonding sites. All of these things lead to a hydrophobic surface, and that makes it difficult to bond or print onto that surface. So, how plasma treatment enables adhesion? Well, what is plasma? Well, plasma is the fourth state of matter, uh, solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. And plasma is basically ionized gas. Uh, what, how we create this by a high voltage arc and then passing uh, compressed air or some other uh, gas through it. Generally, it's compressed air, which gives us uh, hydrogen, I mean, hydrogen and oxygen species, OH species. Uh, 
Uh, it also has positive negative electrons, uh, UV light, which uh, gives it color, uh, and then free electrons floating around, and you're bombarding the surface with this, and hopefully doing some very constructive things to that surface. So what are we doing to the surface? Well, we're doing three things. First, we clean it, we micro etch it, and then we functionalize. So what do we mean by each of those? Cleaning, the first thing it does is remove any static from the surface, and that static can remove, so anything being held on by the static is generally blown away by the pressure of the air pressure behind it. It also removes organics and inorganic impurities. Organics usually take the form of hydrocarbon chains, so when you're bombarding them with oxygen uh, ions or hydrogen ions, you're creating CO2 and water vapor, and they just go off into the air. If you have inorganic purities on the surface, that can be a little more challenging. Sometimes they have to be pre-cleaned. Uh, other times, uh, with enough energy from the plasma or the flame, you can burn those off. So those just require some testing, uh, which we can provide, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, so you have your plasma source here in the picture. On the left-hand side, you see a contaminated surface area. It goes through the plasma, and then on the right side over there that you see the contamination is now gone. Uh, the second thing it does, and you can see from that same picture, uh, it micro-etches the surface. Uh, you've got a smooth manufactured surface on the left. On the right-hand side, you have an etched surface. Now, this is somewhere in the range of 5 to 30 nanometers, but when you're increasing the surface area, that is increasing the bonding area that you have, and it will increase the, the, uh, the overall bond, in this case, with the ink. Uh, lastly, and most importantly, you're functionalizing the surface. And by functionalizing the surface, we mean we're adding oxygen groups, hydrogen groups, hydroxyl groups, and in the case of flame, carboxyl groups, uh, which most of these are polar groups added to the surface. You're adding these on the outer couple molecular layers, uh, and they will increase that surface energy, uh, which makes it easier to bond. So again, uh, plasma is doing three things. It cleans the surface, it etches the surface, and it functionalizes the surface. A little bit about adhesion basics. Uh, there's two forces in play here, one with the ink, one with the ink and the surface. Uh, the forces holding the molecular bonds together or the, the molecules together in the uh, ink itself are the cohesive forces there. Uh, the adhesive forces are the difference are the bonds between that ink and the surface. So if you look at the picture on the right, if you have a low surface energy material like we've been talking about, you're going to get what you see on the untreated surface. Uh, the bonds of the, the cohesive bonds in there are stronger than the, the adhesive bonds between the ink and the surface, and you're going to get it. The, to uh, you know, ball up in the, in the little circles that you see there. That's very poor print adhesion, very easy to rub off, uh, and it's not a good surface. Now, after treatment, on the treated side there, you'll see that the bonds, it, it, the associated with adhesion between the two materials is greater than that of the cohesion. Now you're getting wet, a wet surface, and you're getting a much better printed surface in this case. So now we've taken our plastic low energy material and turned it into a high energy material. Uh, we've eliminated surface contamination. Hopefully we've gotten all of that off. Uh, if there are additives that are migrating to the surface, we've minimized that or reduced that. And we've added increased bonding sites with our functionalization and adding, uh, again, hard hydroxyl or carboxyl groups to that surface. And now instead of the hydrophobic surface, we have a very hydrophilic surface that is allowing us to bond uh, in this case, the ink to the surface. Uh, this is uh, a before and after. Uh, so the before uh, that we talked about with the hydrophobic surface, you're not getting a good ink droplet, and this is what it's going to look like on the surface. Uh, if I was to measure this with a contact angle, it would be a very high contact angle, a very low dime. The ink is not wettable onto that surface, and it can be easily removed uh, just by rubbing on it. After plasma treatment, you'll hopefully see something more like this. Uh, you'll get complete wetting across the surface. You've got a very hydrophilic surface. The ink is going to stick very nicely and, and very difficult to remove. These are some materials that we uh, generally treat or we see. Um, we have polyethylene, you have PVC, polypropylene, cross-link polyethylene, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and also in this picture, you'll notice what I mentioned before. Uh, the, in, the integration of this is generally very, very simple. So uh, in the picture that you're looking at here, this is a higher speed application. We're using two blown ions. 
uh, in advance of the print head. Uh, this allows us to go up to maybe 300 feet a minute uh, on the, this application. So again, uh, it also could just be a material that is harder to treat and harder to get um, the good surface energy that you're looking for. So that may be why we're using two heads in this particular application, I don't know. But uh, again, very simple integration. All we need to do is point it at the right area, have it the right treat distance away, which is usually three-eighths of an inch or so, uh, and you're going to increase that surface energy. Uh, some common materials uh, and pre and post treatment numbers you have there. Uh, we have, again, some polyethylenes that we've treated with both flame and plas plasma. Uh, we started in the low 30s to 40 uh, and got those with the plasma to 46, 9. Uh, but flame does much better on crosslink polyethylene uh, at above 60, 9. Uh, and then if you see some more, PVC started at 35 and went above 60. Uh, again, anytime you're increasing the surface energy this significantly, chances are you're going to have a better surface to print on. Uh, many times, uh, ink manufacturers will be able to tell you that you need to be in this uh, dyne range in order to get good adhesion to that material. So uh, we will see that uh, customers say, hey, I need to get to 55 dyne in order to get a good adhesion. So uh, we look at the material, we look at the different things that we can do, whether it's plasma or flame, and then we recommend a solution. So what are our options when we're doing this? We have four different technologies that we use. Uh, blown arc and blown ion. The blown arc is pictured on the top right-hand corner. Uh, it can be used a couple of different ways. A dual head version of that will go up to about seven inches. So we can, if we're printing on a large area, that might be an option. We also can run the print parallel with that head so that you've got, that you're receiving seven inches of treatment over a relatively small area, maybe a half an inch wide, uh, and sometimes that is the best method to use. Uh, we also have the blown ion down at the bottom right hand side. Generally, as we said before, you're treating at about a 3 8 inch distance gap, uh, and it's going to be able to treat about 12 millimeters or about a half an inch wide. So uh, again, wire marking, you generally use something like a blown ion. Uh, both of these use compressed air and electricity, so they're very low cost, um, incremental cost, I should say. Uh, you're, t you're usually looking at maybe 12 to 15 cents an hour to operate one of these machines. Uh, so they're very cost efficient, very easy to install, uh, and works well on a lot of different materials. If you have a higher speed line, you might be looking at something like the blown eye on 500. Uh, that's actually the middle picture there. Uh, the 750 is on the left, uh, which will treat uh, 75 millimeters or about three inches. Uh, these can be used for very, very high speed applications. Uh, if you're talking five, six, seven, eight hundred feet per minute, you might need to use this device. Uh, these are, the, again, the 500, which is the middle picture, is about a three kilowatt device. Our, our normal blown ion is 500 watts, so this is basically six uh, blown ions in series. The 750 is a five kilowatt device, so it's basically 10 blown ions in series. So again, this is very, very high ion density, uh, will treat a surface very, very quickly, and is a, is a, is a good application, or it's a good uh, tool to use for those high speed lines. Lastly, we're gonna talk about our flame systems. Uh, sometimes uh, a carboxyl group is just what you need for certain materials, as you saw in that chart a few minutes ago. Uh, we were able to treat, I think it was cross-link polyethylene, uh, just did a lot better with flame. So uh, flame is also very high speed. You can go hit 50, 100, 150, 200 feet a minute, depending on the application. Uh, the burner you see right there in the middle of the picture is actually called a pencil burner. Uh, so it would look very similar to uh, the blown ion as you treat the surface. Um, plasma works really well in a lot of, a lot of applications. Flame just works better in certain materials. So uh, that's why we use our lab uh, or we do some in-house testing to decide which is the better material. Sometimes we'll know going into it that flame is going to be the best option or plasma is going to be the best option, uh, but it's always best to test because um, many of the jackets, even if it's the same base material, have some additives or other things into it that will affect how you treat that surface. So a few examples real quick. Um, before we finish up, uh, this is uh, 
a blown ion on the picture on the right. It's an older version of our blown ion. In this particular case, there was a CSA requirement that the customer needed to meet uh, in order to pass his wire. Uh, and before plasma treatment, he wasn't able to get but one or one and a half cycles uh, before the ink would rub off. But after he was able to treat this, uh, he was exceeding 10 cycles, and that far exceeded what his requirements were. Again, this was just a polyethylene jacket that we were treating with. Um, what we would use today is the blown ion 125. The next application is printing on terminal blocks. Uh, again, this is an inkjet application, even though it's not wire and cable. You can see the terminal block passing underneath the plasma at the bottom screen there, uh, and then you print on that surface. Uh, then we took a piece of tape on the unprinted version down at the bottom, and you're able to pull the letters you know, right off, so it's very easy to rub those off. Uh, the top one has got a secure print. You've got a good wettable surface, and that ink is going to stay where it needs to be. Uh, in this case, it says we were able to increase the throughput two and a half times. Maybe we did that a little too well. Maybe we wanted to cut that back a little bit so we'd sell some more equipment. Uh, I'm kidding, of course. Uh, but again, we were able to increase this production two and a half times by adding plasma to the situation. Lastly, um, printing on bottles. You can see there the, on the bottom right-hand side, the plasma is coming out of the path, and then it runs over the print head, and we're able to print um, and get a better, uh, in this case, he said better clarity on the bottom of that bottle uh, for his date codes. Uh, so this is, again, just another printing application using plasma. So how do we qualify these? Um, we, we do a lot of testing is the basics. Uh, if you have a CSA standard or some other standard that you're trying to meet, that's best to know up front. Uh, we can run these trials in your facility. Again, with plasma, we have these units uh, all over the country. We also have a lab in Menominee Falls uh, where we can run some testing there. Uh, but many times it's very simple just to bring the system into your facility, put it in line, print, and see if we're able to increase that surface energy so that you can pass your scratch test or your acid test or whatever it may be. So um, we will help you in any way. These, these tests are free. Uh, we have units all over North America and uh, other parts of Asia and India. So these things are easy to test and we'll be happy to help you with those. And lastly, what else can plasma do? Well, we, we try to ensure that the surface energy, is op, surface energy is optimal for your application. If you need to be above 55 dyne, uh, we'll try to figure out the best way to get you there. Uh, and again, at some point you get diminishing returns at higher dyne, so there's no reason to get it to 65 or 70 if that takes more energy or more money. Uh, so we try to uh, optimize that surface energy for you. Uh, also, uh, Prior to the jacket actually going on the wire, many times we're actually cleaning the conductor with plasma and or flame. Uh, so this is another common application. We clean the conductor before the jacket comes on, and then after the jacket is on the wire, we will help with the printing. Uh, sometimes this allows for less expensive ink or jacket to be used. Uh, this is common uh, around uh, plasma and flame. Uh, many times you can use less ink, less adhesive, uh, adhesive less uh, a less expensive jacket or less expensive materials in your application because you're getting better bonds uh, because of the increased surface energy. And of course, hopefully all of these things will help you have peace of mind that you've got a good quality, repeatable process in, in creating uh, good surfaces. And I believe that's it for me today. All right. Thanks, Wilson. Um, you know, as mentioned earlier, it's often the combination of technologies which ensure success. We've had a good look at the first part of the process, which is the uh, plasma or flame surface treatment. Um, when we look at uh, ComScope, um, Andy Setzer uh, commented that the pretreatment by Entercon and the ink chemistry of our next presenter's company, Jem Gravier, proved to be key to their success uh, in mastering wire and cable inkjet printing. So with that, uh, Huck Hyde will now take us through some of the keys to ink chemistry for printing on wire and cable. Thank you, Mark. Um, continuous inkjet printing is, uh, it has been around since 1979 and has continues to improve all the time. So it's also a continual improvement in making and, and producing inks for the printers. 
when we talk about benefits for inkjet or continuous inkjet, um, it complements the old style of gravure contact style printing with advantages such as variable data. You can do a now a sequential footage count. You can do serial numbering. You can do lots of variable data uh, on the fly. It doesn't have to be change the wheel to create different data. It's also non-contact. It does not have to contact the actual surface, wire surface or any other surface, for the ink to be sprayed onto the surface itself. So you can uh, print on curved, hot surfaces straight, straight out of extruders, um, and even soft surfaces that you can't touch because you'll deform the jacket or do something odd. Speeds are, are uh, impressive as we can get up to 1800 feet per minute now with inkjet printing. Um, flexibility to be able to move a printer from line to line and have all of the data you need in that printer to be able to print the legends or text that you need on those products. The ease of use is much better. You don't have um, too much learn learning curve because of touch screens and the new softwares. Um, if you can operate a mobile phone, cell phone, you can operate a printer pretty much. Um, intelligent use, which makes it to where we can take your application, streamline your operation by, by putting in line with uh, a database to where all of the operator has to do is scan a barcode, download the message to the printer, never have to really enter any information in. It's all hard set already in your database, and you have less chance of mistakes on the line. Cost is much lower cost of ownership. Um, compared to laser or other contact style printers. Industrial applications, you can glance down through here, not just wire and cable. We do, you know, inkjet is used for all applications in this day and age. So identification needs, what, what do you need to identify? Your wire and cable, how do you need to identify that, why? Well, UL says you've got to put um, all your information on there so that your end user or your contractors or whoever's buying the wire or uses the wire can properly identify it and know what wire they are using. It can also be used to put your logo in and, and, and make your wire stand out because you see that logo and automatically know it's yours or your company's brand. Um, you identify inventory management with it. You can use barcoding, uh, all kinds of different um, applications to do quality control. Um, the product mark has to be durable. That's why we're here talking about adhesion and uh, the inks that are used for different various substrates. As uh, Wilson mentioned, there's all kinds of different plastics out there. Um, we can't obscure and for the inkjet industry, we're, everybody wants something that's bright and shows up very well on all of their products and all of their different colors. Next slide, please. All right, so inkjet fundamentals. Um, basically, a continuous inkjet, it, basically when you open the print head, you're looking at a stream of ink flowing from the nozzle to the gutter. Well, it's actually not a just a solid stream of ink. It is actually droplets broken up into um, freak, by a frequency um, anywhere from 64 kilohertz, which means 64,000 drops at that point that we pointed at just a second, going through every second, or all the way up to 140,000 drops passing that point every second. We use um, controlled charging to charge each drop and then it flies through an electromagnetic field and gets deflected, as we say, and becomes a drop that misses the gutter and goes out to the surface of the wire. CIJ technology, okay, um, fundamentals is, you know, you can do dates, text, batch codes, QR codes, and logos with all the variable uh, new technology that's out with all the CIJ printers. Um, like I explained before, we can go up to 140,000, 120,000 drops per second, which makes for very fast printing speeds. Um, message being printed, the drops are selectively charged, okay? So it knows which drops to charge 
and how much to charge them to make them form letters. And we'll show you a letter here um, in a slide coming up. So they're deflected into a dot matrix basic character. So when we're talking about printing drops, that is, we, we call it drop dot matrix. Uh, the nozzle uses a piezoelectric crystal to synchronize and break the drops up into the size and spacing that you want them to be. The tunnel then charges the drop selectively, and then through the deflection field, the drop is moved out of the pathway of the gutter and placed in where that position is, where it needs to be to form a letter or a logo. The drops that aren't deflected are recaptured and sent back into the printer to be used again. Here's a uh, perfect example. As you can see, a system itself has a makeup ink bottle and then a mixed tank or sub ink bottle. So when your solvent is your base for your inks, evaporates, your makeup puts nose to add, the machine knows to add makeup into the ink uh, mix tank and mix, make the ink thinner again, back to where it's supposed to be. These printers rely on a certain viscosity to stay in um, good working order and good printing uh, quality. So you go through the electromagnet valve, the pump will pump the ink into the nozzle and into the um, chamber, ink chamber itself. Um, the ink chamber then has the ceramic crystal and the ultrasonic vibration, creating the vibration at the nozzle to create the droplets, as you see, running through the charge electrode there. Once you can see those drops getting charged, move through the deflection field and out to form that letter E. Each time that letter moves, that is called a stroke. That is how the printer knows your wire is moving and how fast your wire is moving underneath the printhead itself. So it can keep up. It won't stretch when you go faster or it won't get really small when you slow down. This just illustrates the printhead itself, the ultrasonic transducer, the charge electrode, the ink drops, and then how they return into the gutter or they get deflected out and get printed onto the surface. Okay, so ink development. As I said, it's very particular as to how these inks operate in these systems. The systems are very forgiving anymore to where you can use a, a kind of a wide, what we call a wide range of um, uh, centipoise or viscosity. So we can go up a whole centipoise or down a whole centipoise in viscosity and still have good operation in the printers without any problem. Uh, Research and Development Center, I work out of Nixon, Missouri. I work with our uh, director of ink technology closely side by side. We now have a second um, site in Houston, Texas, um, where we have a development lab there as well. Um, our largest industry has always been wire and cable. Um, this has led to most of our formulations for specific jacket materials, specific plastics, cloth, braids, metals, everything that you can think of that you guys do. We have run across and we are more or less a specialty ink house for coming up with um, formulations that work well with your applications. But as Wilson said, some of these um, uh, surfaces are just, are you have to do, you have to etch, you have to treat to get them to open up so that our ink polar bonds will stick with their, with the polar groups on the surface of the equipment. We have in-house milling equipment, so we make our own custom dispersions. We uh, use um, surface treatments, like I said, as Wilson said, for tough substrates but we try to formulate our inks to where we can get away without treatments, but not it's not always possible. Um, we are all manufactured and designed in the USA. Jim is very proud of that. Okay, so dye-based inks versus opaque inks. I don't know if you've heard you know, differences in the two, but dye is very simple. Dye is a simple thing. It's like your food coloring dye. You put it in water, like sugar in hot water. It'll dissolve. It'll become that color. You don't even know that it's it's not part of that 
liquid. Um, they allow for bright colors. Uh, you can get really good dark black codes with, with good black dyes, but they are susceptible to heat, solvents, and plasticizers. The, the dyes will dissolve easily in solvents and heat can make them disappear. Um, plasticizers can also cause them to what we call leach or spread out. Um, we use in all of our uh, all-purpose inks uh, marking on packaging or paper uh, for wiring cable it's a little more difficult because you have to worry about transfer so we have to use micro pigmented or soft pigmented coming up in a slide or two to keep away from happening the transfer happening when you spool the wire up in large spools die bases are much easier to operate in the printers as well more forgiving um, heavy pigmented now it's you're talking like a throwing a rock in a pond or putting sand in water and trying to get it to float um, that's what heavy pigment basically is in an inkjet solution we cannot get the inkjet uh, solution we cannot get the ink thick enough to hold and, and suspend that heavy pigment take your white house paints for instance um, if you let it sit in your garage for six months and you open it up there's usually most of your white is at the bottom and you've got kind of a clear or a yellowish yellowish uh, fluid at the top of it the thing about heavy pigments though they grow great contrast and dark surfaces mainly white codes but we can add colorant to that and give you nice pretty colors as well light blues uh, light purples uh, pinks um, the adhesion is good, very, very good with, with the heavy pigments. Um, we can add different additives and they play well with the pigments and they will withstand high temperature. Um, use of a single color across uh, different colors of substrates. Everybody wants that one color that works on everything. Well, we can't quite do that because of you have a light blue, but all of a sudden you come up with a light blue jacket that it doesn't show up on. <laughs> so it's difficult, but it can be done. We have inks that will show up on most all jackets. Um, it's good with print, printer operation as we put in stirs and mechanisms to make the printers run when they're not being used to where it keeps the ink moving and the pigments stirred up. So soft pigmented is kind of in between dye and the heavy pigmented inks. We call them soft pigmented because they're like sugar and cold water. They will solubilize, but not completely. And what I mean by solubilize is, is, is basically um, blend into the solution um, and become part of it. Uh, the soft pigmented allow for great con contrast um, with less pigment. You don't have to have as many pigments. Um, thus giving you the ability to keep the pigment suspended in the solution without having stirs or keeping the machine running all the time. Um, it will do with several colors, more than dye-based because of we have better, better um, choices, shall we say, um, and, but fewer than heavy pigmented because we can't just add a colorant to it to make it a, a lighter or darker color. Uh, good heat resistance is with the soft pigments as well. And like I said, no mixing me mechanism is required in the printers. Now, components of a successful ink jet fluid. What does it take to make one? Well, first we have to start with a solvent, okay? Our solvents will be a solvent that is not um, too harsh for the printer, one that you know uh, swells rubber, things like that, and that will solubilize or let ingredients become part of the solution. The colorants on will play a part as, like I said, the soft pigment is the heavy pigmented. Um, so the dye-based, well, yeah, you can see them, but they're more transparent or translucent, shall we say, as compared to the pigmented. The pigmented will opaque or create opacity to where it'll cover the substrate and you won't see the dark color underneath. Um, like I said, transfer is good too. Resins, that makes all the difference in the world. Now, resins, when we talk about resins, we're talking uh, with UV cure, we're talking oligomers and monomers, which Pam will talk about here shortly, but we have to make sure that those oligomers and monomers work well in the inkjet systems and cure under the light with the fastest rate that you can get. 
um, the resins are what provides your adhesion and your durability and the resistance of any kind of alcohol or chemical wipe. Additives. Um, this is the salts, the other uh, metal uh, adhesion additives, anything else that we have to put into uh, the inks. Basically, a photo initiator uh, will be very pertinent in with the UV inks for the ink to cure at a certain wavelength with spe specific lights. Um, Pam will talk about that a little bit more here coming up. But these additives are, are, can help stabilize the dispersions. They can help make the ink more stable and keep the, the pigments and things floating uh, or suspended in, this, in the solution. Different types of wire jackets. You guys are wire and cable guys, um, probably in this for sure. So you know a lot about jacketing materials. Um, the thermoplastics and thermal sets. Uh, each component we do with an inkjet fluid, we basically formulate to work with different chemical compositions in jackets. Um, the many different materials of jackets make it where we can't just formulate one ink to work on everything. We have to specifically use different additives or resins to create adhesion or polar bonds, polar groups to bond with your type of material. We have to match the surface energy of the chemical, you know, chemical composition of the jacket, um, or else, like Wilson uh, showed us earlier, how the drops kind of drew up and, and did not wet out or or spread out like they were supposed to. So basically, what you would see is if you didn't have good um, uh, compatibility between the the ink droplet and the surface, that droplet would draw up and kind of look like a puzzle piece rather than a nice round donut sitting on your on your wire or your jacket surface. So to kind of wrap things up, um, we, we go through this remember to be safe component. S for substrate. Okay, what are you gonna be printing on? Is it gonna be a polyethylene? Is it a polypropylene? Is it anything you can treat? Is it something that uh, is, is easy enough we can stick on already, PVCs? Now, PVCs have become more um, very, uh, challenging, shall we say, in the recent years because of new plasticizers and new things to get the PVC to last longer and to be more uh, uh, sunlight resistant. So it's created new challenges for us. That's the thing we need to know um, for to be able to help you with getting you a complete solution. Do we need to use plasma pretreat? Do we need to use flame pretreat? Uh, will UV stick to it? Will UV be curable on it? The next one is application. Will inkjet work for the application? Okay, that's where we come in. We'll offer our expertise to you to help you decide whether inkjet will work for you or do you need contact? Do you need a different type of uh, printing application for your, your product? Um, Please, you know, uh, that's what we're here for. That's why we have the expertise and, and we we have the people and the knowledge to be able to help you make a, a informed decision on which way you want to go with it. And F is for finishing, okay? Re requirements before or after printing. Like Wilson told earlier, said earlier, does it have to meet a military spec? Does it have to meet the aviation specs? Some of those can be very harsh and very hard, hard to meet. Um, we've had uh, people say that they have to meet certain specifications, and when they perform those, the actual surface is being removed that the ink is sitting on, and they're saying the ink's removing, but it's actually too harsh of a test, and it's removing the surface of the, of the material rather than just the ink. So there's a lot of things we go through, and we will do sampling for you. Um, we will send in your product. I will find the best solution of ink treatment um, for that part of it, the pretreatment. Wilson and uh, uh, Intercon can help you out with that as well. Um, we work well together. We closely together to provide the best solutions for our customers. End use. Where will this product be used? Well, that's it, it's. That's exactly what I was just talking about. Will it be drugged through the mud? Will it be in an overhead, in a conduit? Will it be, you know, lots of different exposures. 
inherent standard application challenges um, material properties ink substrate mismatch the chemical composition um, what resins we use that tells us uh, can we readily stick to the surface or that's where Mike uh, it comes in you send us samples and we make sure that our ink will stick to the surface or we will recommend what treatment you may need or may not need to make your application work contamination yeah the cleaning of, uh, of, a, of a dirty wire or anything else when you try to print on top of dirt the ink sits on top of the dirt and can be wiped off easy uh, are you cutting or is there oil involved is you know will this wire be stored in a hot environment will it be direct sunlight all those things come into play when we try to find a solution for you um, surface tension that's where we you know, where mark or uh, where intercon comes in with creating a surface tension our dyeing basic dyeing level is anywhere from 40 to 42 to get excellent adhesion of most of our inks on it on most surfaces um, we have to withstand harsh in manufacturing environments, of course, you know, grease, gasoline, scratch, rub, moisture, sunlight, that's, for some substrates, you know, UV LED curing may be the only option um, to be able to withstand all that stuff. We make inks and formulate as best we can, but without, you know, a little bit of help from our friends at Intercon and, and Omnicure, uh, we can't may not be able to offer you an option of just a straight air dry ink. And successful Hawk, partner. Hawk, thank you for those insights on um, uh, ink chemistry and the application requirements. Um, so now we've seen, you know, preparing the surface, getting the chemistry right for the application, and we're going to move to the final step, which is the um, the UV curing part. And once again, um, you know, we have an example of a customer, Jay Ivey uh, at OFS, as he can attest that uh, adding the Omnicure UV LED technology made the Gem Gravir inks for their applications uh, indelible and to live up to the requirements uh, that their applications had. And so with that, our next presenter is from Omnicure, it's Pamela Lee, and she will cover ways you can optimize your UV LED curing for your application. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I thought that before I get into the details of UV LED curing specifically, it would make sense to um, discuss UV curing technology as a whole and, um, and understand what it actually means to um, have UV curing. So um, Huck did have a really good um, explanation of the various types of inks um, in UV is one of uh, the various that are available. And it utilizes something um, called polymerization rather than evaporation of the ink itself in order to, um, to print. And so in this, um, what's present within the ink is our photo initiators and they um, are triggered uh, or triggering the hardening of the material. And this occurs with the presence of um, UV uh, to help um, start that process. Um, however, there is um, a requirement and some factors that um, that affect uh, the, the 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 ability for that to happen, and it includes the uh, type of UV source available, um, as well as the energy that is that is there to um, to determine the speed and the quality of that cure. Um, so. Once the application of um, ink is up is is there with exposure to a UV light source, and in this case uh, LEDs specifically, the reaction will be triggered and the cure will will result. Um, and so factors that determine um, the cure include um, the intensity of of the light as well as the dosage, which is actually um, the amount of the energy that's received by the material and that is determined also by the speed at which you are printing um, or exposing your your substrates to um, the light source um, uv um, if you go to the next slide can be looked at um, from the spectral content in the contributor so traditional uv lamps mercury lamps actually have a very broad spectral output which means they have contributors from 
the UVC, which is the 200 to 280 nanometer range, UVB from 280 to 320 nanometers, and UVA as well, um, which is 320 to 400 nanometers. Um, this means that when you expose um, materials, UV um, materials to uh, UV lamps, you typically do have contributors within uh, that will react with the photo initiators that are present in the ink. Um, however, when you look at UV LEDs specifically, um, they are essentially monochromatic and um, they emit a very narrow band uh, of, of, of of light. And so as an example, uh, 365 nanometer LEDs um, really only fall in the UVA spectrum. And um, these four examples of very common um, UVA wavelengths are 365, 385, 395, and 405. And each of these really have only a plus minus 10 nanometer um, uh, range and uh, you, you can see that it does drop off quite dramatically outside of those key peak areas. Now when you look at the relative intensity of UV LEDs this is a depiction of earlier generations where uh, the relative output was actually very low and um, the adoption of UV LEDs for curing and printing applications was um, more challenging. Um, if you look today, however, um, UV LEDs have increased significantly um, in their uh, efficiency and output so that more than sufficient power is, is, is available to successfully print and, and be used for applications. Not only that, um, but compatibility is key and um, what's what's um, interesting is that the industry has now also come to realize that a match with the chemistry and the um, light source is very critical and um, unlike beliefs in the past where you could just replace the use of a, a mercury lamp with an LED source, um, we understand that that isn't possible and that you do need to look at um, the materials data sheets to to ensure that uh, they are reactive to the LED light sources that you will be applying to it. Um, UV LEDs bring a number of benefits for inkjet printing and um, really do, I think, allow for a lot of customizations. Huck did speak about this at length about uh, having control and the, the ability to include variable, variable data. Um, LED curing in combination with that really does increase the flexibility of, of um, print printing. Um, there are a number of productivity enhancements just from the use of LEDs themselves. I mean, you can achieve a much higher control of the output. Um, and with LEDs, it, it is, a variable intensity that you can control uh, so that it's not fully on or off. Um, it's not digital like um, traditional lamps are. And so this allows you to adjust the output accordingly and um, really customize um, the type of, of uh, results you would like. Um, not only that, but uh, you can, can achieve a wider range of um, substrates that can be supported uh, with the very low temperature curing that you get from LEDs. Uh, there are no heat damages um, to the jacketing or materials and um, you can achieve a number of different finishes as well just from either strobing the light or um, having uh, different intensities and uh, use, being used in the application. Um, what's also notable is that LEDs are significantly um, lower maintenance than um, its, its lamp counterparts and um, in, in that sense it provides a lot of operational cost benefits um, and uh, savings. Um, it uh, it, it uh, can operate for over 20, 30, or 40,000 hours, depending on your use cases. Uh, and in comparison to lamps of only a couple thousand hours, um, you, you have a lot more on time. And LEDs can also be controlled so that they're only used during um, 
during its use time and it doesn't require warm up of cool down as lamps traditionally do. Other benefits are um, also included uh, are environmental. Um, many companies are now adopting um, green technology initiatives. So LED curing actually falls quite well into that. Um, there are no VOC emissions um, and it is actually very, very easy to integrate. So with these um, designs without having um, ducting required and or shutters, um, you can not only use it for new implementations, but also retrofit. And um, given the space requirements that are needed for um, LED curing solutions um, being much less than um, than its counterpart, uh, the, the UV lamps, it becomes very easy to install these. And with um, the air-cooled in particular, you can easily just integrate them into your um, existing in existing machines. However, we do need to remember that um, compatibility with the ink formulations and the curing uh, solution is, is necessary. So it isn't always just a swap and replacement where you use the existing um, formulation of ink and expect that the LED um, uh, curing solution will work. So it will require some testing and, and um, validation that there's a compatibility and and such. So um, what's also um, notable is that these units are very scalable as well um, so that you can easily increase your production speeds um, and grow your 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 uh, cure or print area. So um, what you can do is stack these units together to either widen the print area or for wire and cable, um, you, ha you have uh, multiple units run um, serially so that uh, your exposure time to UV uh, light is more and you can, as a result, increase your print speeds. Now, UV LED curing systems um, are not just um, simplistic devices, they actually are, um, can be differentiated from, from one another based on how well each of the, the system components are designed. So on its surface, you may see that um, there's a certain performance benchmark being promoted um, and uh, certain features, but what's important is to look at how well uh, it's designed, um, particularly from the LED module or the light engine portion, as well as the thermals, um, because effective cooling of uh, LEDs uh, will really impact its lifetime and performance. Um, you may have a solution that uh, appears to have very good output um, at its infancy, but as you operate it and if thermals are not uh, well managed, um, those LEDs will degrade extremely quickly and the output you get uh, at even um, time, you know, a, a couple thousand hours uh, from, from start of life can change dramatically. Um, if, if you do manage those thermals very well and are more cautious with that, the lifetime will be maintained very effectively um, over its, its um, usable life. And LEDs are, are typically defined um, with an L70 life, uh, which means um, the life, the output at 70% seven, seven, of its um, start of life output, what um, that duration of time is. So when you look at specifications, it's important to see what that L70 is and how long that output can be maintained uh, up to 70% of its original output. Um, electronics and power drivers are also very important because they monitor and control the system. In our case, we, uh, with Omnicure systems, we do have a number of protection mechanisms as well as monitoring um, to ensure that the device is being run at a healthy temperature. Um, you can control each of the outputs of segments and, and all of that. Um, and finally, optics is one last uh, component within the system that we um, take a lot of care in manipulating the optical bell output depending on, um, on the application. Now, looking at um, the module specifically, we do have uh, within the Omnicure 
solutions, um, patent technology um, for module addressability. And that means that uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see we have control over um, each of the segments so that we can not only control the output, but also vary the cure width for each of the solutions. Mark, if you can advance to the next slide. Thank you. So this um, design of the module um, allows us to uniquely control this. And the most important thing is um, in, ensure the uniformity is um, is very tight across the line. And this is very important when it comes to printing and curing um, in general, because if there is a large variation across the line, then the uh, consistency of the curing uh, will, will will also vary, which means you may have sections that are, are cured adequately and others that are not. If you go to the next slide, it's an example to show you how uniformity can affect um, affect the output. So here with all the modules at the same input level, you'll see um, quite, flux, uh, quite a large fluctuation from its peaks to its uh, troughs. Um, and this is measured uh, at a very close working distance. What it means is that if you are curing um, or, uh, inks that, that are near the troughs, um, they may not actually cure. Um, with our ability to adjust the out um, the output power accordingly, you'll see that you can then tighten the um, uniformity across the line to plus minus five percent, which gives a very tight tolerance and um, and very good control across that line. And finally, optics is the last um, thing item that uh, you can really customize or optimize within your cure LED curing system. And it really depends on the application. So we have expertise internally to design appropriate solutions to meet those needs. So UV light is divergent and very small changes um, in the working distance can greatly affect what the output is that, that is seen um, at, the working dis at, work at the working surface. So, um, we have a mil the ability to manipulate the light to maximize the output depending on the application. So LED curing systems can vary in terms of performance, in terms of size, um, and, and even in, in the mechanical form factor as well as the optical uh, output area. How do you select the right one uh, for your application? Um, it's very important to determine the requirements of your application um, and know what the irradiance or dose requirements are, um, as well as the process speeds. These really will affect um, the solution that's right um, because uh, thing, other factors such as working distance as well and homogeneity needs will also uh, determine what will work. Um, I know that Wilson and Huck both stress this a lot and I would like to as well. It's that um, testing is extremely important uh, to validate things and uh, you often need to look beyond the specs and look beyond just um, what you see on paper because um, Validation through testing is the best method to to ensure that that solution will work. And if you control parameters and st and strictly define what that process is, you can um, then have a very repeatable process um, to to uh, to create recreate. And Omnicure through Excel test, we we also have a very similar approach to evaluation and have. Um, equipment available for testing so that you can um, ensure that the compatibility with the ink is there and um, also validate whether uh, surface treatment is needed and, and, and to uh, test that um, the print is adhering and curing adequately. When it comes to fiber um, or wire and cable applications, there are a range um, and this is depicted here from um, 
coatings to coloring um, to printing and marking and ribboning. Um, each of these have different requirements um, from the application side and uh, it not only is the cure width different um, but also the implementation itself. So we do have a, a range of different solutions that are appropriate for this and um, I'm not going to go into too many details as we're running into out of time but the next slide does show um, the various solutions that would be appropriate for each of those applications. And so again finding the right solution for printing is really um, dependent on compatibility, testing and validation of the materials, the process parameters, and um, and all the all the um, equipment that you will be used will really define what um, a success, successful implementation will be. Um, so I think that through Intercon, GEM, and Excel tasks, we have proven that um, quite successfully. Um, and we do have a very good adhesion with the use of our three solutions um, for printing, inject printing on um, cable. Thank you. Thanks, Pamela. Um, we'll uh, do a quick wrap up here and then get to our audience's questions. Uh, some of the things covered today were the numerous benefits of inkjet uh, printing on wire and cable, uh, indelible, non-contact, the ability to have variable data very easily, high speeds, and, and the versatility and flexibility uh, as well. Uh, surface trading role being to clean etch and functionalize surfaces to promote wettability and ink adhesion. Uh, the importance of getting the ink formulation right for your specific application, um, and the UV LED curing technology and ways it can be manipulated to, to optimize the curing results and certainly um, all, all three of our presenters talked about being able to test and validate um, your application. Uh, so with that, let's get to, uh, to some of your questions. Um, and again, you can reach out to uh, our presenters directly as well. First question I have is for Wilson. Um, without actually printing, how can you determine if the surface treatment is actually affecting the uh, wire or cable jacket? Uh, without printing, we usually use uh, one of the either methods of dyeing or um, contact angle. So we use different tools in our lab to show the d increase in that. It's not a perfect situation. Uh, testing is always the best way to go. But uh, if you increase the dyeing by 20 points or you reduce the contact angle by a significant number, uh, you can look at that with polar and dispersed energies on that and you can usually determine that you have done a good job increasing the surface energy but again testing is always the best way to go. Thanks Wilson. Um, I've got a question here for Huck. Um, this person has heard that with continuous inkjet printing the inks aren't as bright as contact printing and also are there a few options besides black ink? Yes, with uh, contact printing, it is true that uh, there, the colors cannot, aren't quite as bright because contact printing, we can formulate those um, ink solutions to be thicker and have more pigment and more carrier in them to where they opaque and, and look brighter because they, they have more color or colorant in them. Um, the second part, um, uh, say that second part again for me, Mark. Um, it had to do with um, colors other than, than black ink. Yes, colors other than black. Uh, yes, we have, you know, white and black, of course, are your go-to colors. They're going to work on every color of wire that you have. If uh, black doesn't show up on black, you put white on it. Uh, if black doesn't show up well on dark brown, you put white on it. Ease of use there. But colors, yes, we have colors. Every color you can basically think of can be made through with our inkjet inks. Um, we don't specially formulate uh, specific color matches, shall we say. Um, we have generic colors that uh, we formulate and know and have tested, um, but to come up with like a printing type solution of a uh, four color process or anything like that, it's very difficult in inkjet because not all the materials will play well together. Thanks, Huck. Um, Pamela, when is, when is it appropriate to use UV inkjet for wire printing? 
So I think it really depends on the application. Um, I, th I think durability is a, is a big one and I think it was touched on as well in the discussion. So UV inks are very durable uh, when cured. So um, Again, uh, whether LEDs are appropriate is also another question. Um, you you need to look at the application requirements, and LEDs, I think, over its lifetime will um, provide a much more um, many cost benefits over time. So I think that need, needs to be considered. Thanks, Pamela. Uh, Wilson, how long does the plasma effect last? Seconds? Minutes? Uh, all of those. Uh, depends on the material. Uh, if you're looking at a fluoropolymer, it might only be a few seconds. Uh, if you're looking at more stable plastics, you can go two, three, four days. But uh, we always recommend that you print on the material as soon as you treat it. Uh, you're creating a highly active surface that will bring in particles from the air and attach to that, which will damage the, uh, or not damage, but cause the print not to be as clear. So um, we can do that testing for you as well in our lab. We do, uh, you know, we'll take your material and do a, make you a curve basically. But again, it's best practice to print on it immediately after. Uh, but most of the time with plastics, you are looking at two to three days where the surface energy remains high. Thanks, Wilson. Um, it's got a, a couple of questions here on applications. I'll, I'll throw it out to the, the entire panel. Um, any advice for printing with white titanium oxide pigment inkjet? Is it more difficult to bond this type of ink versus other types and colors? As far as the bond with the TiO2, titanium dioxide, um, the bond is actually we can create better bonds with the heavier pigments than we can with the dye base or um, uh, soft pigment in ink. So, it's more problematic as in, like I explained in my uh, ex at webinar, that it's heavy. So it wants to fall out of the solution. We cannot make the solutions viscous or thick enough to keep the, the TiO2 suspended. But we have alternate uh, ways to get around that and by stirring and keeping the machines running um, on a regular basis to keep the ink flowing in there. Um, necessarily, they, they don't really add that much to adhesion. The resins are where we get our adhesions, uh, as well as with, like um, Pam was talking, the, the oligomers, monomers, and photo initiator when it comes to the UV curable inks. Thanks, Huck. Here's another one. If I wanted to clear coat with a PU over top of the ink, what's the best way to get strong adhesion between the ink and the PU? maybe partially cure the ink before clear coat and post cure ink after clear coat is the question. So yes, I think that approach will work quite well and we have um, seen a number of implementations where that has been effective so that um, with the pre and post cure, um, you not only um, cure the, the ink first and then apply the coating, um, uh, you have you, you have essentially a double cure uh, effect of that. Thanks, Pamela. Uh, this uh, person has a question. I have a polypropylene marking application. Uh, on general, how would that differ from other substrates? Is it more challenging? Is it doable? Uh, polypropylene is doable. Um, polypropylene doesn't work generally as well with a flame pretreatment, but uh, plasma works very well on polypropylene. Uh, so as a pretreatment, I would I would recommend plasma, uh, and then we can move to uh, you know what kind of ink we need to use. And I can attest to that. Um, Wilson makes a good point that. Um, polypropylene without pretreatment, it is very, very difficult to stick to. It's like polyethylene. They're very similar. Um, we do have certain inks that have a little better adhesion, but if you want good permanency of the ink, you will have to pretreat a polypropylene or polyethylene substrate. Uh, that kind of leads to um, a, a, another question on how, how these technologies interrelate. Um, if someone uses plasma treatment, 
Um, when would they still consider using UV curing um, when inkjet printing? Basically, what you're looking for with UV curing is a an ultimate resistance to any solvents, uh, sunlight fading, sunlight resistance, um, as well as durability to rub and abrasion and scratch. That's where UV comes in when it has to meet those real extreme requirements. Uh, is the ink fully cured after exiting the UV uh, treatment area? Yes. Um, if you define your process well um, and, and complete your testing, you generally um, should have a, a quite a good cure. Um, over some time, uh, you can do the appropriate tests to confirm um, whether it's rub tests or um, scratch resistance tests. Um, I know that for wiring cable, often you'll, it'll be effective to do rub tests and see how many cycles it can withstand. Um, so generally uh, what we've seen from uh, the results of our testing is um, very good adhesion, very good cure um, uh, post, post um, process. Uh, Wilson, a question regarding can you use flame treating for wire printing and how would the cost compare versus plasma treating? Um, yes, you can use flame treating. Uh, it's depending on the application, uh, it's hard to say about the cost um, and depending on what kind of integration that you have to have. Uh, sometimes it can be very similar. Uh, many times if you're using a lot of communication, the, pl the flame is going to be a little bit more uh, obviously, the consumption cost of the fuel is also something that you need to consider. So, uh, the you know the incremental cost will be definitely higher with flame. Uh, but there are just some materials that just work better with flame, and uh, you would need to use that in order to pre-treat. Okay, we have a question specifically about uh, if OmniCure has testing facilities in Ontario, uh, but maybe if you could each just talk about where your testing facilities are and if you can also do tests in the field. Okay, I'll, I guess I'll start by answering for OmniCure. Um, we do have um, an on-site facility in Ontario and specifically Mississauga, Ontario. Um, and we actually do have um, an in-house um, special, material specialist um, who can do analysis and testing of um, cure with our equipment as a, as a preliminary uh, validation. But um, in addition to that, we have equipment available that can be arranged for um, on-site testing uh, at potential customer facilities it's themselves too. And that can be done by arranging through our um, reps and in the US and distributors um, uh, in Europe and in Asia uh, to do the, the testing. So um, contacting us will help um, help us determine what, what solution might work for you, what your application needs are. And um, in addition to that, we have uh, applications experts as well that have seen a wide range of different um, different uh, implementations and can help provide some feedback as to what would be the most appropriate for um, what you're trying to achieve. Huck and how about Jen Intercom. and their, um, oh, go ahead, Will. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Uh, Huck, go ahead. Okay, thanks, Wilson. Um, our, app, our testing facility is all right here in Nixon, Missouri. Um, we do, we send, have customers send samples in to us of what they're trying to mark, wanting to mark, um, and we do all the proper testing. We look and we identify the substrate with an FTIR, um, a laser uh, reading machine that uh, gives us, and we have a big database of all the different plastics and everything that we pull from so that we can identify the plastic and if it has plasticizers and all that good stuff in it um, to, to make it to where we can give you the best solution. We do also offer on-site demo and trials of this continuous inkjet inks, uh, printers, uh, to once we decide on, or once you decide on what ink or 
what you're looking to try, then we can set up a demo demonstration or a trial with you. Uh, and as for Intercon, we have labs in Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, which is just north of Milwaukee. Uh, we have a lab in the UK and a lab in India, uh, but we also have reps um, all over North, North America and in part, other parts of the world uh, where we can bring that equipment into your facility. So uh, give us a call and I can point you in the right direction to get the best test, uh, best test location for your application. And uh, Wilson, I uh, have a question that uh, definitely would, would go in the category of testing. Um, have you ever experimented with UV ink printing on PTFE um, jackets? Uh, we have um, many times. Um, PTFE is uh, extremely difficult. Any fluoropolymer is going to be a challenge. Doesn't mean it's impossible. Uh, there are certain other things that need to be considered. Probably have to take this one offline. There's too many things to go over. Uh, but in general, fluoropolymers are a more challenging material. Uh, they do not hold their surface energy very long if you do treat them. Uh, so some specific things have to be done in order to get that to happen. Uh, there's also other uh, gas formulations that might need to be used uh, to try to use uh, a, a, a treat on Teflon. All right. Um, we've got a few more questions, and then we'll wrap up here. Uh, thanks, everybody, for, for hanging with us. Um, let's see. Um, is clear coating very common? Would it be over the whole diameter, and would it need an LED source on two sides of the wire? So whether you need um, one LED source or two or multiple really depends on um, the what you're trying to the, the, the surface area that you're trying to cover. Um, there are some applications where we've seen coatings um, be more effective with um, multiple heads pointing at at the um, at the at the wire or cable, so that uh, you can uh, approach it from all angles and ensure that there's a uniform cure around. Um, the challenge often with the underside of of um, of a cable is that um, unless you have the light source um, applied to that, uh, you will not be able to cure it. So um, if it is uh, a coating around the, the entire di diameter, then we would suggest that you have multiple units um, directed at that or have reflectors of some sort. But often reflection in itself is not nearly as effective as having the direct um, line of sight source uh, from from LED units. Thanks, Pamela. Um, and a final question here: Is black UV ink available? Yes, black UV is available for the standard or microwave style curing. Um, LED black UV is in development and has proven to be a difficult development, um, as we have found, because, like I say putting all those components together and getting them to work well in, outside the printer as well as inside the printer, print, printability, runnability, cleanliness, um, longevity, uh, uh, non-exposure to light, things like that come into play. And it's, it's a little longer development process, but it is in the works. Thanks, Huck. We also had a few questions on um, different materials uh, each of you may have on how to explain the processes that work. Um, and certainly in our, our follow-ups, um, our audience will get access to that. Uh, everyone should receive an email tomorrow with the recording of this presentation along with the slide deck, uh, as well as getting a certificate uh, uh, marking their participation in today's presentation. Uh, that'll conclude our webinar for today. Um, if you uh, liked the presentation and got a lot out of it, please let our presenters know. If you have ideas for future presentations uh, and technologies, uh, also reach out and let us know. Um, with that, that'll conclude today's webinar and have a great day.